RC here. Hey everybody, RC here. So uh, I was sitting around and I was just kind of working on HDR files and I said, you know what? Rather than me kind of just sit there and work by myself doing HDR stuff, I was like, you know what? Let me just go ahead and just kind of offer for people to kind of come and you know, just, just watch a quick process. Right? I'm not going to get into too much of a conversation about how to be able to do stuff, but I figured, you know, if I could you know, offer to people a chance to just kind of check it out and just just kind of watch over the shoulder, then it would be cool. So I was like, you know what, let me just go ahead and do this. Uh, and I'm just adding people as we're going through here and uh, seeing if people want to come. There's, uh, I mean, obviously there's probably people that are watching this just right off of the, dress off of the Hangout on Air, so that's fine too. Uh, obviously, if we're doing all of this stuff, all of this stuff is going to be, you know, streamed and recorded afterwards. So, in the interest of kind of keeping things moving, I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to go screen share. I'm going to go to my desktop, and we'll kind of move these, kind of move this back over here. Actually, you know what? Before we do, let's give a couple more people just a chance to kind of just get here. Just uh, Charmaine. So, tell us yeah. where you're from. What do you do? I'm in Australia. Awesome. Very good. Photographer? I'm learning. I'm I'm new at it, but I'm loving it. And Kevin and Teresa have helped me so much. Nice. Very, very cool. Good, good. Well, good to have you on. It's good to have you on. So, I'm so excited to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. Hey, Kevin, what's going on, man? How are you? Pretty good, buddy. Good to see you again. Not bad, man. Good, good. It's yeah. all good. It's all good. So where are you from? West Virginia. West Virginia. You gotta remember, I've asked you all how many times. You're gonna come here and shoot, buddy. Yeah, I know. Well, actually, where am I going? No, that's North Carolina. I'm going to North Carolina. Probably you're just not far from me. Yeah, I'm going to Greensville, I think it is. I have a tour that I'm taking up there, so I'll be up. So yeah, it'll be pretty great. decent. It looks like Lynn Hughes is just a big white box. So we'll just say hi to Lynn and we'll hope that she can hear us. And then we have Teresa over at the very, very end. Hey, Teresa, how are you? Good, how are you? Not bad, not bad, not bad. So let's go ahead and start working on this. Now that we have our people, I'm going to get, just go to the desktop real quick, bring this down. And what I would ask is if you guys could, if you guys could just go ahead and mute yourselves while you're doing this. It'll probably be a lot easier. You know, so just go into you know, just go into your mics and just go ahead and make sure that you mute them, just so that we don't we don't have any feedback. It makes it a lot easier for me to just kind of show you guys what's up. So this is the file that I was working with, right? So this is this is out of that series that we were doing in Bodhi, and let's go ahead and I have them right here. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So. It's nine exposures. More often than not, when I'm outside, whenever I have anything that has like a bald blue sky like this and some sort of mountain outline, I'll almost always try to shoot the widest possible range that I can. So this is my lowest range. And I'll go ahead. I'm just going to command click all of these here just so that you guys can take a look at them. All right. And now once I have them command clicked, I'm using Lightroom. Obviously, you can do this in Bridge and you can do this in whatever other program you have. But so that's file number one. That's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now, for me, I probably would have sacrificed a little bit more of these highlights. So you see this one right here at the very, very end. I don't necessarily need it. But I don't necessarily like the fact that this file that I have here at the very, very bottom isn't completely dark. I like I almost always I did that when I did the HDR book, I always tell people shoot for the basement on a file like this. What I would do is I would try to shoot so that the lowest file that I have is probably closer to this to make sure that I have a nice top for this sky. It makes it a lot easier for me to be able to work with. In this case, I think it's going to be fine, but looking back at this, I would have sacrificed this stop that I would have had here at the very, very high end for this one. And the, the best way for me to be able to do that is I set myself up under nine frames. I would just go minus one EV, and then that would bring everything down so that this would be the most exposed, 
and I would have gotten one that would have been one stop darker. But this will work. It'll be okay. Now, from here, I'm going to go ahead and just highlight all of these guys. And just in the interest of just kind of keeping everything uh, common for people, right? I'm a big fan of using HDRFX Pro, but I know that a lot of people are using Photomatics. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go over here. I'm going to right click. I'm going to export. I'm going to go to Photomatics Pro. If you were using Photomatics by yourself, you could just go right into it and just go to File and then Load Bracketed Photos and find the files that you want from there. That would have been just as fine. But what this is going to do is this is going to take all of these files and it's going to merge them, right? So I'll go ahead and I'll do this. HDRFX Pro or Photomatics Pro. In Lightroom, you get all of these different options. What do you want to do? You want to align images? Yes, I want to align images. I don't crop because I could always crop later. I almost always align my matching features. I'll go ahead and I'll reduce ghosting artifacts automatically. And every now and again, I'll use this intermediary 32-bit image. The one thing that I do do in this is at the end of the file name, I'll give it whatever the file name is that it's having there. I leave it as a TIFF file, and I usually add the words HDR. The reason that I do that is because let's just let that export. And this is just a specific Lightroom thing, right? You could have a lot of different images. In this collection that I'm working with right now, you'll take a look. I have 91,643 images. That's a lot of images. So how would I find across all of these collections any files that I worked with that are tone mapped as an HDR file? It'd be impossible for me to do that. So what I would do from here is I can use either collection sets and make sure that everything is kind of set up in collections and collection sets, or I can come all the way down here to the bottom, and you'll see that I have a series of what are called smart collections. Right? So inside of Lightroom, I can get and click on the plus sign here and create something called a smart collection. And a smart collection is going to say, all right, well, I want to look for a specific characteristic across my entire library. So let's say files that I used, oh, let's get in over here, that I used for HDR. Well, it's going to be from the top level, and what I want to do is I want to match these rules that I have here. So I can say, for example, all of these different things I can look for. So in this case, what I would do is I would say in the title, or actually not even so much in the title, I would say in the file name, I want to make sure that the file name contains the words HDR. So now when I click on create, this goes through all 91,643 images and finds all the files that have the word HDR in them. I can go all the way down to the bottom and it'll immediately show me the most recent ones that I did. So that's just a quick Lightroom tip. It just makes it a lot easier for you to work with. Now in here, this is still working. Is, every, is everybody good so far with that? That seem pretty okay? Questions, concerns? No, doing all right. Good. Yeah, good. So, and you know, I'm not I'm not covering a lot of the basics and things like that. You know, obviously, you guys are going to do basics on you know, copy training or online or YouTube. We're just going to kind of proceed at a quick clip here. So, we'll go ahead and go back over here. We'll go back to the desktop. Now, this is the file. So, think of HDR as a giant sandwich, right? You take these nine images, and these nine images, in of themselves. Let's see, if we go back to, let's go back to that collection. It's in Bodhi, day one. And inside of this day one file is where I have all of these. So these are all the different files that I'm working with. And I know that it's, if I need to just kind of quickly find it, I'll just go to attribute. And under attribute, I just have files that are tagged, not five stars, but files that are tagged red. And it makes it a lot easier for me to go, all right, well, these are the files that I'm working with here. So why am I doing HDR? A lot of the times, what I tell people is I don't look at HDR from a technical standpoint. I look at it from an artistic standpoint, right? People get into the entire run of what it is and what it isn't. And at the end of the day, I'm just like, it's just art. It's just I'm just playing around with it and doing stuff. But it's important to note that when you're looking at this, all of these files, as you're looking for them, all of them have a series of compromise, right? When you're working with HDR, you want this to look really, really nice, and you want to have a lot of these textures, but your sky's blown out. You know, you come all the way down here. 
Now you have the sky with a little bit of the wisp of the clouds, but this is blocked up in shadow. You want to be able to get some of the detail that you have over here on this, but now this is a little too bright, this is a little too messed up, and we definitely don't have any information in the sky. So in photography, when you're dealing with some of these things, it's all about an issue of compromise, right? Now, what HDR does is it takes all of these different files, these nine files, and it merges them together into this giant sandwich. That sandwich is called a 32-bit file, technically. So this file here is a 32-bit file, and it has all of that tone of all nine of those files. There's a problem. The problem is that this tone is well past the range of what we can see on a monitor. So it doesn't really look very good. It's very anticlimactic, to be honest. So what we want to do is we want to take all of this tone in this area that we can't see and map it to an area that we can see. That process is called tone mapping. That's what you classically know HDR as now. And that's right here under the tone mapping section. I click on this. Done. That's what you classically know HDR as now. And that's right here. That's good. The... And mute that. Uh, there we go. Thanks, guys. So in here... What I'm going to do is just, just to kind of show you where I went, I'm just going to go ahead and save this setting, and I'm going to call this wagon. I'm just going to save that preset. Now, default. That's what my default looks like. So more often than not, what I'll do is I usually jack my strength way up. I jack my color saturation somewhat up. I jack my luminosity up just a tiny, tiny bit, but I don't worry too much about luminosity because for the most part, the detail that I'm looking for in these files is in detail contrast. Once I drag that up, it's going to darken my file quite a bit. So I'll usually do strength, color saturation, and detail contrast. Then from there, I can kind of ride luminosity a little bit better. Lighting adjustments. If you go all the way to the right, you have a very naturalistic shot. If you go all the way over to the left, you have Elvis on Velvet. So where you stand in this is entirely up to you. There's no right or wrong answer. And this is what, this is makes the HDR that people hate. This makes HDR that people think is natural. It's just where you are on this continuum. You decide. My, my job's not to tell you. you. It's your job to figure out where you want to be. Now, I'm going to keep it, let's say right around here for now. You'll see what's happening in the sky here. Here, here, here. Halos. Big, big problems. You could take another image in Photoshop and bring that back in, but I'm not going to make that decision yet because I'm going to come down here and the next slide that I always work with in Photomatics is Gamma. So Gamma is the midpoint between dark and lights. So if you drag this over to the left, there's predominantly more dark pixels than light pixels. If you drag it over to the right, there's predominantly more light pixels than dark pixels. And it just, over the, overall, it kind of gives you a bit of a contrast boost, but it makes the image a lot darker. From here, I can go ahead then and adjust my white point, which is what is the brightest part of the image, and the black point, what is the darkest part of the image, making them darker or brighter. Now, in instances where I have a sky that's involved like this, what I'll do is I'll grab smooth highlights. Smooth highlights will help you quite a bit in working with halo reduction. So if you grab smooth highlights, drag it over to the right, watch what's happening. Halo reduction now is pretty much, it's pretty good. This is a little bit of a pain. I'd probably come back over here and kind of play with this a little bit more to see if I can get it. But for the most part, I'm pretty happy with this. Once I have that okay, I'm going to go ahead and click on Save and Re-Import. Let's go ahead and stop there real quick. How are you guys doing with that so far? Pretty good. Pretty straightforward? Pretty easy? I do got one question, though. Sure, what's up? How do you know how many shots to take? Like a certain shot. Um, I always tell... I have a very non-scientific way of doing that. For the most part, I usually tell people it all depends on the relative distance between you and the place that you're at. What do I mean by that? Well, all right, so let's say you're at Yosemite. If you're three miles from Yosemite Park, then you probably can afford to be pretty good about going three frames or five frames or seven frames. If you're 3,000 miles away, 
shoot the snot out of it. Shoot nine frames, but then be done with it. What happens is a lot of the times people turn around and they usually look at that and they go, um, well, I don't know whether or not I should shoot five, seven, or nine because I don't want to overshoot it and I don't want to do this. And I'm like, are you going to get a chance to go to Yosemite again? Exactly. If you're not, shoot the snot out of it. <coughs> Worry about that part later. And it's like, because if you don't need them, you can always just throw them away. Now, for the most part, what I would do is I tend to shoot almost always five frames. Five frames is almost always what I use. When I'm in bright sunlight, I'll tend to go up to seven and nine. If I'm shooting something in the middle of the day and I know that I'm going to have a mess, I'm going to go to nine. I'm always going to go to nine. Yeah, because yeah, that's what I tend to do. That's what I tend to do. It's a little bright and I shoot more. But it's, I mean, it's just like at the end, I think about it and I'm like, what happens is a lot of the times we want to get overly technical with the camera. There's times that you can be over te technical with it. There's times that you can't, right? So what would I rather do? Would I rather sit there and look at the back of the histogram and go, well, the histogram has a really, really good bell curve and it's showing a good proportion of this and it has a highlight clip of this. Or I can just shoot the scene and be done with it. Capture it one time. You know, and what happens is when people go out and they shoot, a lot of the times they set their tripod down, they put all the stuff down, and they'll turn around and just start firing shots like it's a machine gun. So they'll sit there, and it's just all you hear is just clack, 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 clack. And they have all these shots that are going through that, and they come home with 400 of the exact same shot. So in that respect, I usually tell people, don't do that when you're doing five because then you're going to come home with the better part of 3,600, 3,700 images. Shoot the nine frame that you did there and move. Go to the next thing. Grab another series. You know, you're much better off to be able to do it that way and your take is going to be a lot better. You've sufficiently covered it. Move to the next section. So, good so far? Cool? All right. I'll talk to you guys about a couple of other annoying things that happen here. So... Let's see. So inside a Lightroom, almost everything that I do is inside of a collection, right? So everything, everything that I want to find is all collection-based. However, whenever you import or you re-import inside a Lightroom, it never puts it right back into the collection. That part, I think, sucks. All programs do that. HDRFX Pro does that. Uh, Photomatix does that. The only program that doesn't do that is Photoshop. I, I believe that Photoshop doesn't do that. So a quick tip that I usually tell people is, if you have the files in the collection and you highlighted the files to do the work that you want to do, leave them highlighted. So long as you leave them highlighted, you can always go back in the library module and go to all photographs. They'll automatically show up in the series and the image that you worked with will show up usually second. So by having them selected, now I go, oh, there's the file that I was working with. Now I can find it a lot easier rather than trying to browse up and down through 91,000 images. Now that I have it there, I'm going to come over here. I'm going to bring it back in here. Now, I've done this once before, so it would not surprise me if I had another one over here. So what I'm going to do is just to be on the safe side, I'm going to come back over here, and I'm just going to go to my HDR images section, and I'm going to come down here to the bottom. Okay, so that looks like it's the file that I'm working with, unless, nope, that is the file. Now, in here, I'm going to go back to this file here at the very, very top. I'm going to double-click on this. Looks pretty decent, right? I always bring it back inside of Lightroom, and inside of Lightroom, I'll go ahead and I'll start making some changes. So, specifically, what changes am I looking at, right? There's almost always, I tell people, don't worry about, inside of HDR, don't worry about color when you're doing any kind of tone mapping. HDR is all about texture. It's all about texture and tone. It's not about color. Color you can change at any other point in time using Photoshop, Lightroom, whatever other program you use for post-processing. So in here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the develop module and I'm going to go ahead and just make that really big. Right off the bat, I can see that I can go ahead and drop my color saturation here. And you'll see that it changes stuff. I can go ahead and increase and decrease exposure and kind of get it wherever I want. So here's actually the file that I was working with, right? So I want to make it warmer. Drag it, make it warmer. I want to increase my tint. Drag it and increase my tint. 
if I want to underexpose the file, and I, I have no problem with underexposing a file even after HDR. That's fine. That's totally cool. Now, this is because I'm used to temperature, tint, and exposure. That's how I see it, right? What if you don't? Right? What if you don't know the color, you don't know whether or not you want to go green, or you don't know whether or not you want to go yellow, or you don't know how you want to work with this? Well, then I would tell you to forget this part. Instead, go over here to your hue, saturation, and lightness. Inside of hue, saturation, and lightness, if you click on hue, you can go ahead and have hue selected, and then click on this little targeted adjustment tool. Having that selected, you can click right on the area of the color that you want to change. So in this case, I'm going to go this green right here. If I go up, changes the color. If I go down, changes the color. Up, down, up, down. So now, rather than guess, I can just make all of the changes that I want from there. So there's the green that I'm looking for. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to saturation, and I'm going to drop the saturation of that green. It's actually a yellow color that I don't like in there. So go to saturation, leave that same tool selected, click, drop it. And this is where you start seeing the limitation of what's happening inside of Lightroom. You can make some basic adjustments, but for here, you're really going to need to be able to go inside of Photoshop and start playing with some stuff. Like, for example, what I wanted to do is I wanted to grab the blues in this sky here and crank them up, but it was hard for me to be able to bring these blues up without really overtoning a lot of this here and without changing the colors that I have here in the rooftops. You have to be very, very, you know, sensitive about that stuff. You only want to do it in the places that you want to do it. So in this case, what I would do is I've made some basic, basic adjustments. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take it into Photoshop and I'm going to add some additional things to this. So Command E brings a copy with Lightroom adjustments inside of here. I go to Photoshop CS6, and this is where I start doing the exact same thing over and over and over and over. It's all through the use of layer masks. There's my layers panel. I click over here, and I go, all right, well, what do I want to do? Hue saturation, just like we did before. I'm going to click right here, click drag but you'll see that that's saturation. That's changing saturation by dragging. So instead, hold on your command key or your control key if you're using a PC and watch that now it changes hue. So once you get it exactly where you want it, you go, all right, well, that's exactly what I was looking for. Now you can grab the saturation and drop the saturation down and get you exactly where you want to be. If it messed up the sky, Remember that that hue saturation layer is applied to the entire Photoshop layer. That's what this white mask means. It means that it's revealing everything across the entire layer. So once you have that mask selected, just go back over here with a brush, select a black color, and now what I'm going to do is I'm using a brush and I'm going to paint with black. There's another quick keyboard shortcut. If you hold down the, the control key on a Mac, the actual control key and the option key, Photoshop CS5, CS6, and you just hold those two down. If you drag, I'm using a Wacom tablet, but if you go to the right, it increases the size. If you go to the left, it decreases the size. Rather than guess which one it is on this numbers or hit the right brace, right brace, right brace, left brace, just right, left, right, left, right, left. If you need to change the hardness, just go up, down, up, down. Soft, hard, soft, hard. That way, no more guessing. I know exactly what I want to do. Now, if you're on a PC, what you can do is you can do the exact same thing, but just hold on the Alt key and just right click. That's all it is. Now, in here, I'll go ahead and I'll brush in this one area here. And all this is going to do is it's going to hide that one section, right? And it's all about very, very subtle changes. Now, once I've done that, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here and I'm going to do a hue set. I'll grab this and let's just say that I'm going to grab this and I'm going to oversaturate this. I'll almost always oversaturate. Then I'll invert the mask by just doing a command I. It hides everything and then with a soft brush I drop my flow relatively low and I'll just slowly 
with the paint with the color white paint in exactly what I'm looking for now if I find that what I'm painting in is getting a little too harsh I'm not necessarily all that worried about it because it's in its own layer I could always just grab the saturation and drop it down and kinda of get it exactly where I need to but I make it I usually overcook it because I wanna be able to see where I'm affecting it see like right now if you look over here I affected the road so what I would do here is I make a smaller brush switch to black paint out that effect right on that road, you don't want it on the road, zoom back out, and now cook it back down. Get it exactly where you want it. So, same thing, make another hue sat, and inside of here, let's go ahead and grab the sky. The sky's not going to give us a lot, a lot of latitude, so what I would probably do from here is I'd probably go back into my original image. All right, so I'll go, let's see. There's my images. I'm going to go to my attribute. Let's just say that this is an image that I want to use. I'll go ahead and I'll do a command E for this one. Bring it right into Photoshop and then just using my move tool drag it and move it right on top of there once I have it there there's new sky old sky new new layer old layer I'm just going to click on the mask holding down the alt key by holding down the alt key and clicking on the mask down at the bottom it automatically creates a mask but it hides everything at that point same thing brush white color got a low flow remember my, my flow is like at 16 percent because I want to slowly step into whatever changes I'm making there and the only reason that I'm bringing this one in is because I think that that layer by itself will be able to take a much better saturation change All right so if I come over here and I do this you see how that layer can take a little bit more saturation than the layer before it but it changes the top of these houses. So having that set, I'm going to use my brush. I'm going to switch to a black color. And I'm just going to paint it off these brush, these houses here, paint it off these houses here. Oh, no, 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 don't do that. And I'll go ahead and I'll paint it off of this house right here. And it's done. This looks a little cooked. So I'll come back over here to these wheels. I'll bring this down a little bit and I'll maybe just adjust the saturation on that right. however you see fit really now once I have the general feel of the file I can go ahead and do a command option shift E control alt shift E on a PC what that does is it takes the aggregate of all of these changes and it puts them into its own layer right at the very very top so this is all of the source files this is the final file See. This file by itself is the sum of all of these things. From here, I'm going to go ahead and start working on detail. There's different ways to do detail. To be completely honest with you, I just use a plugin. It's just easier for me. Right? So I have all of this stuff here. I'm going to filter, Nick software, raw pre sharpener. Look at how much detail you leave you leave on the table when you don't sharpen your raw files. Right. Now that's a little overcooked, right? It's at 94%. But watch this. That's when you when you shoot raw, demosaic and colors and things like that, sharpness are all things that are applied when you convert to a JPEG in a camera. When you have a raw file, none of that stuff is applied. So every raw file, in good measure, is going to require an amount of sharpening to it. If you don't believe me, take a look. This is before. See how soft it looks? After. Before. After. Before. After. Click OK. Now this file gets a sharpen layer that sits directly on top of that. Once that's done, just in the interest of keeping with time, I'm going to go ahead and go to Color Effects Pro 4. Right? A lot of the times, like a lot of that stuff, 
when I talk, when I talk about, you know, it's it's almost kind of got like this surreal glow. Truthfully, you know what that is? That's right here. <laughs> There's no hiding that. Color FX Pro 4 has this portrait effect that they have called glamour glow. That's all it is. Ta-da! You go over here, increase your glow. It's going to make it really, really weird. Just up the percentages on your shadows, up the percentages on your highlights, maybe warm up the image if you need to do some final warming. All right, so I'll get it up a little higher. If I need more glow, I'll go ahead and I'll pick it up here. Once that's done, click OK. Now, what I, what I don't like of what it did here for the file is it jacked up the sky a little bit. I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of what it did in the sky. So, zoom out. The sky got a little weird here. I would just go ahead and just make a mask using black. Bring my sky right back to the way I had it before. Just a quick brush adjustment that's there. Once I'm happy with the file, if I, I can grab everything, merge it, save, close. And let's see. This is take, now this is taking a long file because that was nine that was nine D eight hundred files. So the level of detail that you have inside of that file is actually pretty big. So let's see our files there. It's a little still a little electric for me. So what I would do is I'd come back right back into the develop module and inside of here put some final color and toning, put some final drops and saturation, come over to some effects, add a little post crop vignette. Maybe not too much. Whenever I add a vignette, I almost always feather. Increase the feather a lot. Actually, I think the vignette's actually taken away from this because it looks like it's a mistake. So I'd much rather, if I need a darker file, I'd much rather just drop the exposure than add a vignette. Matter of fact, in this, I would probably increase the vignette so that I don't lose that corner on a burn. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even be opposed to coming in with my tool here, just my little quick brush after I made all those changes and dropping a little bit of that exposure there. That's it. Once that's done, you know, save it, export it out, and get it ready for people. So, straightforward. <laughs> well, well done there. Oh, uh -huh. not a problem. Very nice. Make it look so easy. <laughs> well, you, well, you know what it is? Is after a while, you just you're just doing it. You're doing the same thing over and over and over and over. And it's mm -hmm. it's it's not it's not rocket science. It's you can learn all of this stuff. I mean, it's you know, once you have the technique and once you know exactly what it is you need to do and the steps on how you do it, it's actually very very easy to do. Yeah, it's taking it back Thank and forth. Thank you. And, uh, and the what was that? Pro taking it back and forth in different programs, kind of. Make me look a little bit worse, a little bit harder on it now. <laughs> yeah, and, that, and that's the thing. It's like, look, I, I'm very grateful at, at people that, you know, that like my HDR shots. I mean, I think they're really, really cool. But at the same time, I usually tell people, I'm like, you know what? If you had the same nine RAW files, you'd be able to knock out a lot of that same thing. I mean, it's, it's not really so much about, I mean, there is some style that's involved in it and all that kind of stuff. But you can learn that stuff. That's... There's nothing really all that esoteric or like we, you know, there's no secret code to that. It's actually very recipe driven. It's very plug-in driven. It's, um, you just kind of just jiggle sliders and move them around to the spots that you need them and that's it. You know? we, have a, we have a guy in our little group that does uh, a lot of uh, people in HDR. And it is, it is surprising some of the stuff he does with people HDR in HDR. Yeah, I like I like using people in HDR. I think yeah. people in HDR is actually very very cool. Yeah, I like I like using people in HDR. I think people in HDR is actually very very cool. Yeah, you're getting. Hey, I'm gonna have to mute you, Kevin. You're getting a lot of feedback. Yeah, I like I like using people. Oh, in HDR. that's not you. That's John. I think it's John. All right. Sorry, John. Just moving. Just uh, muting you there, real quick. Just getting some feedback. But 
that's pretty much it. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and actually here on the I'll go ahead and I'll screen share. Let me see. Open up a new window. Real quick. I'll take the file. I'll do it tomorrow morning. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this. Uh, let's see. I'll take. Uh, I see. I posted an image. This image that I posted, where is it? He, uh, no, not that one. This one. Oh, I love that one. I'm, I'm going to put together the source files for this so that you guys can work on this tomorrow. So you'll you'll see it tomorrow morning when I when I get it into the office. All right. The funny part about that is that, that file. If you look, that file is where is it? Let me see. That is the oh. It's, yeah, I'll, just, I'll do it the very, very easy way. <coughs> Let me see. Do, 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 do. Uh, i got to find a file here real quick. So I'm just going to go to my desktop. I'll share that window. I'll bring it on to tunnels. Now if you look inside of Lightroom, I'll go to all photographs. And at the very bottom I have the most recent file. So this is the file that's there. And it's actually it's very, very cool, but there's a lot of detail on that. That's what kind of made me want to really play with it. Right? There's I mean you can see the keys, it's still loading, kind of cool. trying to parse all that detail. Bring all that detail on that wood grain too. You see, like you see the knobs and and all that kind of stuff, and but what I like about it is that this is actually a cut of this file, so it's actually a much bigger file. This is this is a merge of two files, so this is nine frames this way, and then nine frames at the very very top, so there are eighteen D eight hundred files. So, just make sure that you have space. Time, <laughs> it's, but I mean, I'm absolutely over the moon about playing with the D800 in terms of quality and in terms of what you can get out of them. I mean, the the file on it is just absolutely amazing. But, is that Bodhi again, RC? Yeah, this is all. This is all. This is all out of Bodhi. This is all one trip in Bodhi. I mean, sh going to Bodhi was like shooting fish in a barrel. Damn. I mean, it really was. It's you can you. Literally running into shots left and right, so it was a, it was a great time. And how, I forget you you posted how you got access, but how did you get in there again? It was actually part of a workshop. It was a, a buddy of mine was teaching a workshop there, and uh, he contacted the Bodhi Foundation and he paid a couple thousand dollars. I think it was like uh, three, four thousand dollars or something like that, and he got us access to it. So. So it's possible. I mean, and, and and it's cool because it supports the park, and that part I think is really, really important. Or you could just be trade, and he gets it to everywhere. Uh, you have to pay somebody. <laughs> Being trade can only get you so far. At the end of the day, <laughs> at the end of the day, you have to pay for something. He got he got into Hans Zimmer Studio for free. What was that? He got into Hans Zimmer Studio for free. Uh, Hans Zimmer is different from a natural park, from a state park. <laughs> uh, unless, unless Hans Zimmer starts punching tickets at his house, it's a little different. Yeah. Um, what was that, John? Hey, what's going on, man? How you doing? I said he doesn't need the money. <laughs> <laughs> who does, really? John, who does? <laughs> who needs the money? I'll take some. All right. Hey, you, you can have it. <laughs> So, all right, guys. Well, on that note, I'm going to bounce. Uh, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for stopping by for the quick you know, HDR thing. I'll go ahead and I'll post this video if you guys want to see it over. As soon as it records, we'll go ahead and we'll post it on there. And then you guys just stay tuned tomorrow. We'll give you the uh, – I'll get you the file so that you guys can play with that as well. All right. Thanks yeah. for having me Thank on, you so much. All right. No worries. Take care. See you again. Thank you. Bye-bye.